Hi everyone, and welcome back to ENMU Reads. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Allington. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the material that I'm covering in one of the classes I'm offering here with the history program at ENMU. And this class covers the history of Asia. And so this is obviously a huge and a complicated topic. And so really in this class, we just kind of get our feet wet, we just kind of get a sense of some of the trends and some of the directions that we see in Asian history and all the different civilizations that make up the history of Asia. But I still think that it's a great opportunity for our students. Um, it's not typical for a lot of colleges to offer a class in Asian history. It's certainly an opportunity that I didn't have as a college student. And so I'd like to give you a little bit of a taste of what we've been doing in that class. And so today we're going to look at the origins of ancient Indian civilization. So this is one of the oldest, uh, it's one of the most sophisticated ancient civilizations in the world. And it is the Asian civilization that has the greatest amount of exchange with civilizations outside of Asia. So it's the civilization that has the most exchange and the greatest interaction with East Africa and with the Middle East and even with parts of Europe, sort of the, the Russian edge of Europe. And so in this lecture I'm going to begin by talking about the geography of India, how that kind of shapes the history of the region. Then I'm going to talk about Stone Age India, the sort of prehistoric remains of Indian civilizations uh, that we've discovered. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the first two civilizations uh, that we see emerge over the history of India. So we're going to turn first of all to talk about geography. And of course the dominant geographical formation that we perhaps think of when we think of India is uh, the Himalayan mountains. Uh, these are the greatest mountains in the world. Uh, you can see if you look at the map here, that they dominate the northern frontier of India. When we think of how is it that we have, what, what constructs India, what is it about uh, this part of the world that it all gets grouped together, because it's a huge land mass, um, and uh, it uh, incorporates a wide diversity of languages, language families, different uh, regions and different geographies. Why is it that all these different cultures are grouped together? And the answer to a certain extent is the Himalayan mountains. Uh, these mountains serve as a barrier, but they also group the land to the south of them together into a single subcontinent. And so the Himalayas throughout the history of India have formed a barrier that isolates India from the rest of Asia. Isolates India from the rest of Asia and at the same time these mountains provide the Indian subcontinent with protection. Uh, protection from outsiders, protection from invaders, also protection from uh, more extreme weather, in particular more extreme cold weather. Nevertheless, the passes over the Himalayan mountains have always been usable. So it's never been the case that India has been totally isolated. That even though you have these mountains, which are the tallest mountains in the world, it's always been possible for human beings to cross these mountains into India or out of India. And so what we find is that human beings throughout the history of India have interacted uh, from India to the outside and from outside India into the subcontinent. And we know that it's the passes to the north and to the west in this area that are the most usable, that are the most easy to cross. And so it's perhaps for this reason that we find that uh, a lot of the outside influence uh, in India comes from the Middle East. It's going to come up through the Himalayan mountains this way. It's going to enter India from the west.
Now, as I said, the mountains, the Himalayan mountains, provide protection for India from the Arctic winds and temperatures that would come from the polar regions to the north. And this means that India is often very hot, often stiflingly hot. And this means that rivers are going to be especially important. And there are two great rivers in India, two great rivers that are uh, fed by the streams from uh, the mountains. They're fed from the snow melting from the Himalayan mountains. These rivers are the Indus River, which you find uh, over on the west here. This is what's going to give India its name. It's going to give the subcontinent its name. Or it's going to be part of what gives the subcontinent its name. And then over here we have the Ganges River. So one very fertile, very rich river valley flowing through western India, and then the other one is going to flow over to the east and out into the Indian Ocean over here. Now, this is a geographic map, and as you look further to the south, you can see that the uh, altitude of the land is rising. And we call this region the Deccan Plateau. So we have the mount cold mountains to the north that act as a barrier, that act as protection. We have the very fertile rivers to the west and to the northeast. And then as we move into the center, we enter a drier, a more arid region, uh, but of a higher elevation. And these components are the main components that make up the geography of the Indian subcontinent. The size and the geography of India have, uh, have contributed to its diverse demographics throughout its history. So we find in India not just five or six languages, but five or six language families. And overall in India today, if you look at the government of India, whereas in New Mexico we're pretty familiar with having uh, government texts being printed in multiple languages. In India, government texts are printed in over 40 languages. And so this is a wide variety of different cultures and backgrounds that we find in India. While we might say that the Himalayas form a barrier isolating India from the rest of Asia, it's also the case that this is still a really huge area. This is a landmass that is the size of six states of Texas, about a third of the size of the US. We might say that it's an isolated part of Asia, but it's a really big isolated part of Asia that incorporates a lot of different diverse languages, uh, cultures, uh, backgrounds, and ideas. A couple of other aspects to talk about just before we move on from geography, and one of those is this idea of unity. At the same time as we have uh, this background of diversity in India, at the same time we have a history of unity. We might ask if we have so many different cultures in such a large area, so many different uh, geographic uh, regions, a river region, a dry region, a forest region, a mountain region, why in the end do we group all these regions together? Why is it that we consider at least most of the subcontinent a single nation today? Why is it that throughout history we've had this idea of India? Is, is it the case that India is something that's been constructed uh, later over time, perhaps by outsiders? And the answer, to, the answer to that is partly yes, but the answer is also no. It's interesting that throughout the history of India, reaching back not quite as far back as we're going to go today, but if we reach as far back as, uh, let's say, 1700, 1800 years ago, um, actually even further than that, over 2000 years ago, we can find evidence of the idea of unifying all of India politically among its rulers and among its peoples. So throughout the history of India, there's been a really interesting mix the one hand of bringing together these different uh, groups, these different cultures, these different communities, but then on the other hand, a sense that there's something that unites them all. 
uh, for something that uh, means that they should be united together in some kind of unified political structure. And what I always ask my students to think about is when it comes to talking about geography, is on one hand to think about how geography influences the culture of India, the culture and the history of India. Um, what difference does it make that you have the Himalayas there? What difference does it make that it's easier to cross the Himalayas going from this side than this side? How does that change the history of India? But then at the same time to recognize that there's a limit to the influence of geography. That this is why we study history, this is why we study uh, the people that make up history. That geography only determines what happens so far. Geography can influence history, can influence the way different regions develop. But within the groundwork that geography establishes, human beings, individual human beings within this region, within the thousands of years of history, still make their own individual decisions that shape the development of this region that shape the development of their communities. So with that background, we're going to turn to the, what we might call the prehistory of India. <clears throat> and this is the period of Indian history when we don't have any written records. We have archaeological records, and we have um, records uh, of artwork, but we don't have uh, written records of how the people at this time spoke of their wants and their desires um, and their stories. And so this is why this period is called prehistoric India. It's kind of a combination of doing history and archaeology. So we have evidence of primitive Stone Age tools in India. And then these tools become more advanced in what's known as the Mesolithic Age. And so uh, these are some of the tools of the Mesolithic Age that you can see here. You can see this next to a finger. It shows you just how tiny and how complex, uh, well, complex is maybe the wrong word because it's still a rock, uh, but at least how uh, detailed the sharpening and formation of the stone would have been. What's interesting is that these Mesolithic tools that are a little more, we consider them a little more advanced, than some of the more basic tools, although you can see over here on the far right, those are pretty impressive as well. And these tools are now being used to hunt and to kill animals, and they're being used to butcher animals and to eat meat, as we see the development of hunter-gatherer societies. Human beings are no longer just eating vegetation, they're starting to eat their animals that they find around them as well. What we see when we look at these Mesolithic tools is that there are some interesting similarities between these stone tools and the stone tools from this era and stone tools from a similar era in the history of Europe and in the history of the Mediterranean. And so, again, this raises the interesting question, are these stone tools the same because different regions have some kind of exchange going on, are in some way influencing one another? Or are they the same because there are only a certain number of ways to carve stone and each civilization is going to reach that point uh, if they're pursuing this kind of technology? And we're not entirely sure. Again, this is kind of something to think about, something that should guide the way that we think about these tools, something that we should think about as we try and understand the interaction of this Indian civilization with the rest of the world. We also find these cave paintings that you can see here. Um, I think these are significant because these are not just functional. So when we start to get into cave paintings, it's kind of like the written word. We're starting to see human beings trying to communicate uh, with one another trying to communicate uh, things that go beyond basic everyday needs. Uh, things they're trying to communicate, aspects of their desires, their ambitions, uh, their disappointments, in the same way that we do today uh, with, let's say, social media posts, to take an example. Uh, Indian cake paintings will probably last longer than social media posts will. Uh, 
when we move forward, we come to the Neolithic Revolution in India. We date this from about 10,000 years ago. Now, this is the point in history that probably a lot of you are aware of, the point where human beings transition from this life of living as nomadic hunter-gatherers to living in settled societies. Um, they begin to use agriculture, they begin to form permanent homes. And this is an important moment, this is a foundational moment in the study of human history uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it provides the foundation for the written records that we need to study history. Without the settled life that's provided by human beings living in societies after the Neolithic Revolution, uh, we don't have the records that we need to study people in the past. At the same time, it also tells us something about these human beings. It tells us that they were willing to make a sacrifice, willing to take a risk, willing to make a change, to try and live in this way, to be some of the first ones to live in this way. Certainly wasn't easy. There were certainly people who didn't survive this risk. They were willing to do this in pursuit of living together. That living in society is important for human beings. It also shows us the rationality of human beings. It shows us the ability of human beings to problem solve and to change their situation. Again, this is something that I always tell my students. If you look at any other animal in the world, today it's living basically exactly the same way that it did uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. And human beings are different. Human beings are able to consciously choose to make these types of changes in the way that they live. And this is foundational for the study of history because it tells us that these human beings, 10,000 or so years ago, had so much in common with us. So much that is different, but there's so much there of common human experiences, desires, wants, and needs. And this is why the Neolithic Revolution is the foundational point in the study of human history. During this period in ancient India, we start to see uh, more advanced tools that are being used. These tools are being used for farming, so we start to see evidence of plows and axes that are being used, that are being used more efficiently in order to support these societies. By around the year 5000 BC, and we're talking, you can cut it a couple of hundred years probably either side, uh, it seems as though the Neolithic Revolution is well established in India and archaeologists start to find evidence of several primitive settlements. The first of these is the settlement of Bolukistan that is in the north and, uh, well not so much in the north, but in the west of India. What's interesting about Baluchistan, and uh, you can see some of the remains here on the bottom right, what's interesting about these remains is that Baluchistan is in a dry climate. And so this has been, continues to be, one of the debates about the Neolithic Revolution. Why does it happen? Why is it that human beings recognize the importance of agriculture or the pattern of agriculture, recognize that this is something they can use they can exploit. And there are a couple of competing theories out there. One of them is, come to the end of the Ice Age, glaciers are melting, the world is especially fertile, and it's especially obvious to human beings that uh, plants grow, where the seeds fall, plants continue to grow, animals reproduce, you can cultivate animals as well as plants. That's one argument. The other argument is that the Ice Age ends, glaciers melt, you're living in a very fertile period in human history, human beings start to reproduce more and more quickly, and then this period of, let's call it super fertility, comes to an end. It comes to an end, and the climate gets a little bit colder, there's a little less water around, plants and animals aren't growing and reproducing as quickly, you still have to support this increased human population. 
That's where the problem-solving aspect of human beings comes into play. Human beings have to work out how to deal with this changing situation. And it's, this certainly isn't settled theory by any means. But what's interesting is that this very early Neolithic settlement in India is evidence for the second theory. That we find, Baluchistan, that we find this very early settlement in one of the driest climates, or certainly not perhaps the driest, but one of the drier climates in India, suggests that it's more likely that the Neolithic Revolution came out of humans having to problem solve their situation not being as easy to find the food that they needed as it had been previously. So that's why, well, that's one of the reasons why this uh, settlement is interesting. The next settlement uh, that we find, or the, the next older settlement that we find, is the settlement uh, in the Zog River Valley. So now we're in a river valley. So perhaps human beings have to problem solve to understand um, how they need to survive with less fertility, but we quickly find human beings consolidating their settlements around river valleys. It makes sense that you would want to have access to water, as much water as you could in that situation. What's interesting about the Zog River Valley settlement is that a lot of the remains that we find are religious remains, or at least as, as best we can tell. They're religious remains that seem to appeal to a type of religion, a type of religious practice that emphasizes fertility, that emphasizes the importance of fertility. Making sacrifices so that the crops will grow, so that the animals will reproduce. And it makes sense. It's kind of the foundation of these people's lives. What I, again, always tell my students, what's interesting is that we find religion so early on that human beings don't attribute uh, the cycle that they're finding in nature entirely to natural causes. They recognize that it's natural, but they have a very strong sense of something supernatural that they need to be engaging with as well. And a lot of times you see theories of anthropology that suggest that religion is, comes a little bit later. It's, it, it's imposed as part of a social hierarchy being established. And that's certainly true in some situations. But it's also very true that religion is something very organic. It's something very primitive that is very much tied to these basic human foundations that we've been talking about before, where we find these settlements Typically, we find religion developing almost instantaneously. If it didn't already exist before, um, which we might have no evidence of. The last of these primitive settlements is the settlement of Amri. The settlement of Amri is important because it's the first settlement in the Indus River Valley. So one of these great rivers in India, one of the areas in India that's going to be most suitable for establishing farms, and it's going to be the foundations of the first great civilization of India that we're going to turn to in a second. And so we start to find here evidence of sustained farming of crops such as rice, sugarcane, find evidence of pottery, and we find evidence of more sophisticated tools, chisels, hammers, and also weapons, spears, bows, and arrows. And so this is the development of Neolithic settlements in India. What I always tell my students in my advanced classes is that it's important to remember that this doesn't all happen at once. It doesn't all happen at once in all places in the world, even all places in India. And again, this is kind of bringing together uh, this uh, balance that we have between how much does geography stimulate, shape, help these changes, dry climate, uh, river valley settlement, and how much is it human ingenuity, human willingness to uh, take on the challenge or take the risk of making these changes. Uh, India is a great example of this because still in India today, we have human beings who are living in pre-Neolithic societies. There are many human beings in India who are living in nomadic hunter-gatherer patterns. At the same time as along with that, we have human beings that are living in great cities that are very technologically developed. And so you can kind of see that it doesn't have to all happen at once. It's not determined. 
there's a lot of human choice in how these societies develop. So let's turn now to talk about the first civilization in Indian history, which is called the Harappan Civilization. Um, and so now we're entering into Indian history. We have written records. What's interesting about the Harappan Civilization is that we're in a little bit of a twilight zone still. We have written records, but we can't read them. Um, we still have not been able to read what these records are telling us. Um, so we're getting more remains, we're getting towards uh, the history of India, but we're still also kind of in a prehistoric uh, situation. So here we find successful Indian agriculture forming the basis for this society. And so by around 2500 BC, we can see that wheat and rice, which are standard crops, are pretty successful, are pretty consistently successful, but that the Indus people have also domesticated a variety of animals. Dogs, cats, camels, sheep, pigs, buffalo, and elephant. And these, especially the animals that you use for plowing, for example, contribute to the agricultural production and success in the region. By around the year 2000, these uh, early Indian settlements are successful enough, are consistently successful enough, that Indian people are turning from uh, simply producing what they need to survive, and they're starting to branch out a little more. And what we find from around the year 2000 onwards is evidence of the production of cotton textiles in India. And we start to find these cotton textiles, or we imagine uh, these cotton textiles being traded outside of India. And cotton, the production of cotton, is going to be one of India's great contributions to the history of the world. Uh, it's going to be produced in other areas, but uh, it really originates in India. So we start to find that some products, some products like cotton that the Indians are producing, are being traded, are being shipped, are being transported to other regions of the world, and in particular to the region of Sumeria. I thought I had another bullet point, but I don't. So Sumeria you may well be familiar with if you've taken any kind of world history, Western civilization. You remember this is where it all begins between the two rivers in modern-day Iraq. And so we start to find Indian merchants, and the development of Indian merchants, and an Indian trading economy that moves these uh, products from India into the Middle East. How do we know that this is happening? Uh, we find evidence of seals, and that's the seals that you use to show that you own something, we find evidence of seals uh, in the Indus River Valley, where the civilization develops. And these are, what you see here are all the different settlements. So there are around 70 different archaeological settlements that we trace back to, um, that we trace back to the civilization. Uh, this is the city of Harappa, which gives its name to the Harappan civilization. The other major site is Mahindradaro, that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail. So one of the items that we find consistently in these sites is uh, seals. Seals used to show that something belongs to you. And we also find these same seals, less of them, but still a number of them, a number of different finds, we find in this area in Asia. And so that's the evidence, that's the basis for our conclusion that you're starting to have trade develop at this time. It's also an indication that this is a trading society. If this is just a society of farmers, you're probably not going to need a seal. Uh, you can't really put a seal on, uh, well, I mean, you can brand a cow, but we're not going to find that uh, thousands of years later. Uh, you're not really, really going to put a seal on the crops that you grow. But the fact that we have seals that have been used to stamp something suggests that you have products, perhaps cotton, that are being shipped to different regions and uh, they're being sold in marketplaces 
you need to identify who they belong to. As I said, Harappa and Mahendradara are the two cities, the two greatest cities that we have evidence of in this region. The construction of cities was one of the main ways in which this Indus civilization was more sophisticated, more developed than those of ancient Mesopotamia. So like I said, if you study a world history, Western Civ class, typically it will focus on the development of civilizations in Mesopotamia. It's, uh, and there's a reason for that. But it's important to recognize that the largest settlements in the world at this time would have been uh, these Indian cities, at least that we have, uh, at least that we have remains from. But these cities, as you can see in the picture on the top right here, they're surrounded by immense walls, walls that are as thick as 40 feet. And these walls probably would have been protection from invaders, but I mean, generally don't need 40 feet to stop uh, a human army. Um, this is probably predominantly protection from flooding from the river, probably predominantly a flood barrier. There's also a huge, at least at Mahendradara, there's a huge fortified citadel that you can see here that rose about 50 feet above the rest of the city. Most of the population, and again this is a pretty good picture for showing you that, most of the population lived outside the city in streets that were constructed along a grid system. Why is this significant? What does this tell us? We have a lot of uh, cities in the United States that are based on a grid system or are built on a grid system. Uh, the advantage of a grid system is that it's easy to get around, easy to understand, pretty easy to navigate. The disadvantage of a grid system is that for an invading army, it's much easier to take control of. It's much more difficult for invaders to get lost. If you look at cities that were built in societies that were worried about invaders, they made it as confusing as possible to find your way through the city, and as easy as possible to defend. So this kind of tells us that the Harappan civilization was not particularly worried about uh, invaders. Um, perhaps there's not a whole lot of war, not a whole lot of invasion in this society. They're more concerned with establishing an organized city. And the evidence that we have is that there's a lot of organization that goes into this city. So we have a grid-based system of streets. Uh, we have interior courtyards in the houses, which seems to be where most people uh, spent their life. So certain amount of privacy there. You're not living your life out in the open. Uh, but we also find standardized systems of building bricks and even of sewer systems and drainage systems. What's really interesting is that the bricks that we find at one Harappan site, so the bricks that you can see here, we find bricks that are basically the same, basically exactly the same measurements and specifications at other Harappan sites. Uh, so this tells, tells us that this is a highly organized society. This is a city that has genuine centralized planning. It is a, a properly organized community of people living together. And we see further evidence of this uh, to the north of the city, uh, where we find uh, granaries that were used to store surplus food. And these supplies would have been used to store food for the populations of the city. And these are populations, these cities we estimate somewhere between 30 and 50,000 inhabitants. So we're talking sort of somewhere between two and three um, portaluses. Around 1750, we start to see problems emerging for the Harappan civilization. After this point, we have uh, evidence that the streets are no longer built on a grid-like system. We find that the homes are smaller. We find that the pottery that they built, that they uh, build or that they forge, is uh, less sophisticated, is less beautiful. And so the, the, there are problems here somehow. We're not entirely sure what led these cities to be abandoned, what led to the final collapse of the civilization. 
Perhaps the change in the way they're building the streets suggests they're worried about outsiders. But what's interesting is that when we find the remains of Mahendradaro, or when archaeologists explored the remains of Mahendradaro in the early 20th century, what they found was that everything seemed to have kind of been baked in. And the, the skeletons that they found, they found a lot of jewelry around the skeletons. Sort of more than you would normally wear, uh, at, least, at least we think. And so there's a suggestion here that there's some kind of panic, that this was some kind of really dramatic event that people were trying to escape from. Generally now, what people assume is that the Indus River had changed its course. Changed its course in a way that was problematic, for the economy of the civilization, and in the end, destroyed these cities. So, again, the fall of the Harappan civilization is probably partly connected to outside influences, but we think, again, here comes geography. Some things uh, develop and change because of human ingenuity and human decisions, but there are also outside causes, like the changing of the course of a river, that are beyond human control. A couple of points about the images uh, that you see here. Uh, these are images of the sort of carvings that we found in the city. Uh, this one especially is uh, considered a religious carving, used for religious rites. And then down here at the bottom, these are evidence of, or not evidence, these are seals from the civilization. So these are the primary evidence that we have. Um, this is what the writing looks like. Uh, I have no idea what it says, and uh, some people are probably closer to having an idea than I, ha than I do, uh, but no one's managed to work out exactly what it says uh, so far. Now we're going to look at a second early civilization in the history of India. And this, again, connects India with the rest of the world. So we've talked about India as connected to the Middle East through trade. This is another good map for showing you how, how close these societies really were. Here's the Indus Valley. Here's uh, ancient Sumeria. Around the year 2000, uh, we have what's known as the Indo-European migration. And it comes from this region of, sort of modern Russia, uh, southern Russia, central Europe. And we find that for some reason, uh, these semi-nomadic people, driven out of their homes, and they migrate all across Eurasia, and they exercise um, kind of an outsized influence on the continued history of the region. And you look at some of these names that are here, Celts, the Italics, uh, Medes, the Assyrians, so many of the most famous peoples in ancient history are migrating out of this region. And today we connect a lot of the languages that we speak, or a lot of the languages that are spoken in Europe, in the Middle East, and even as far away as India, we connect them back to these Indo-Europeans. We talk about Indo-European languages, the Indo-European language family. These commonalities in language originate with these people who lived in a common region and who then, around this point, around 4,000 years ago, migrate to different parts of the Eurasian continent. Now, these people, as far as we can tell, were what we call pastoralists. I uh, already said they were semi-nomadic. What, what does pastoralism mean? Pastoralism is really interesting in the context of studying the Neolithic Revolution because it's kind of a halfway house. These are people who are not living as hunter-gatherers, but they are not totally sedentary either. Instead, they're herding animals and migrating animals. A great example of a pastoralist is a shepherd. Uh, sheep, the way they consume grass, is very destructive to the grass. And so, therefore, they constantly have to be on the move, and people like these Indo-Europeans would move with them. So they haven't established settled places where they live, they're not building cities, but they're also not entirely uh, roaming free. 
So these pastoralists are migrating throughout Eurasia, and around 1500, some of them come to India. These people are called the Aryans. These people are known to history as the Aryans. And this period of Indian history is named after them, is called the Aryan Age. And so the Aryans make their way into India right around the same time as we have the decline of the Harappan civilization. So it's kind of like a one-two blow if you're the Harappan civilization. The Indus River is changing its course. You have a lot of geographic challenges. And you also have this new people who are coming into this region. New people, the energy of uh, outsiders coming into a new region combined with the challenges that you're facing from the river. And so the Aryans enter into India and they start to settle around the Indus Valley as well. And they live in a very different way to the Harappan. Instead of building huge cities, carrying out long distance trade, they live in much more simple villages each village is ruled by the tribal leader, so the village is basically all the people in the tribe. The tribal leader is called a Raja. And uh, they live this pastoralist life, this kind of agricultural life. And so some people ask, you know, even if the Harappan civilization was going through this difficult time, why was it, uh, or how was it that the Aryans were able to defeat them? Um, because it seems as though there's some fighting that goes on as well. It's not all geography. And the reason, or the most commonly given reason, is the use of horses and chariots, and also the use of bronze weapons. So these are additions that the Indo-Europeans bring with them into Indian society. The use of the horse, which was native to India, and the use of bronze weapons thought that these gave the Aryans enough of an advantage that even though they were going to live a life that was more simple than the Harappans, they were still able to defeat them. As they settle in India, the Aryans begin to develop a more settled society. They begin to make objects out of gold and iron. They become carpenters, wheelwrights, blacksmiths, weavers and spinners, so they're starting to adopt some of the achievements of Harappan society. And this is part of the what's so interesting about the story of India. It's a story of different outsiders coming in and both bringing something different with them, but also being integrated into this existing society. Uh, another thing that's interesting about the Aryans, as far as we can tell, they were avid gamblers and they developed the dice, the six-sided dice, uh, supposed to have its origins with the Aryans and their arrival in India. The Aryans also developed a very rigid caste system that uh, you see here. And this is uh, one of the aspects of Indian society that's going to be very important for the next two or three thousand years. It's a society in which your position in this society is determined by your birth. And you can see uh, this, uh, this chart gives you a pretty good guide to the different classes in this society. And the class that you were born into determined the type of life uh, that you would live. As a, a priest or an intellectual, as a warrior or a, a political ruler, as a, a merchant or a farmer, as a worker, or as someone who was out of caste or an outcast in the society. So with the arrival of the Aryans, Indian society becomes very hierarchical and very hierarchically determined. Uh, so your position within this hierarchy, as I say, is determined by birth. The other great contribution that the Aryans bring to the study of Indian history is the development of Hinduism that dates from this time. For the Aryans as a pastoral people, the study of uh, fertility and balance in nature was extremely important, was 
even more fundamental than it would be for a merchant living in one of the great cities of the Harappan civilization. And it's from this period that we have the text that's known as the Rig Veda, or by some people, the Vedas. This is our earliest written record that we have from Indian history. And again, it is a religious text. It's a religious text in an Indo-European language. Uh, so we have this collection. The Rig Veda is a collection of about a thousand different poems and hymns that record the language of the Aryans, and they record the way they pray. What's very interesting is that some of the names of the different gods that I've given you up here, we find those in Middle Eastern texts as well. Uh, not exactly the same names, but really, really close. And so this again is showing us kind of this common heritage of the Indo-European peoples that connects, uh, in the end, uh, European people, people from European descent, even with people from uh, Indian descent, thousands and thousands of miles away, this common migration led to the dissemination of common language, uh, or at least a common language family across Eurasia, which helps uh, connect, helps uh, support the study of these different regions. So, uh, that's all the material that I'm going to cover. I don't think I have that much more, no, just the common Indo-European background that we learn about through the Rig Veda. So, uh, just to kind of sum up what we've covered about the history of ancient India in this lecture. We've learned that ancient India is this interesting mix, right from the beginning, of rural and urban life. We find people that are living in cities, we find people that are living uh, in more rural societies, right from the beginning. We find people whose lives are based on agriculture, and people whose lives are based on trade. So that's one of the themes in Indian history that's established very early on. Uh, a rural but also an urban element. We find the influence of outsiders is really important. I referenced this a couple of minutes ago, but we're going to see this throughout Indian history. New peoples, new populations entering into India, always through the same route, always through those northwest paths through the Himalayan mountains, and they're going to bring with them changes in languages and society, but they're also going to be shaped by the society that they find. And lastly, we find uh, the importance of religion. That religion is something that's very fundamental to the study of Indian history. We find it with the origins in the earliest remains of settlements uh, that we have in, uh, from uh, Indian history or Indian prehistory. And the very earliest written record that we have, you can see a copy of here, is a religious text. So religion is going to continue to exercise an important influence in the development of Indian society. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, taste of the study of Asia that we're doing at Eastern this semester. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to contact me, to contact one of the other history professors here. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, if you have any kind of questions or interests in the program, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Happy to be interested uh, to talk to you about your interests. Thank you.